Aloha, you're listening to Chad Ford's NBA Big Board on the Lockdown Podcast Network. We're talking NBA rookies in the first week with coach David Thorpe, who thought Evan Mobley and Scotty Barnes were the two best players in this draft. So far, he's looking really smart. Let's go. All right, and I'm with Coach Thorpe of True Hoop, and I want to thank thank everybody for making NBA Big Board your first listen. Every episode, we are free and available on all platforms, and this episode of NBA Big Board is brought to you by McDonald's, proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get your tasty, affordable food. It's an unofficial community center. A big thank you to our friends from McDonald's for always being there. I'm loving it. Coach Thorpe, I'm loving you. Always love having you on the podcast. Love your work over at True Hoop for those that haven't been over there to check it out. Last time we talked, it was a Monday before the draft. We decided we're going to do a little uh, breakdown. We'd been talking really kind of all draft season, especially about Scotty Barnes. You surprise everybody by saying, look, I think Evan Mobley's the best guy in this draft. Number one, Scotty Barnes. Number two, it was not Cade Cunningham. It was not Jalen Green. We're one week into the NBA season. You look like a prophet um, right now. And so I thought I'd bring you back and let's talk about some of these rookies and let's see what they've been up to. And uh, let's start. I actually want to start with a guy that you had number two, because this was the guy that you had so much insight on. Uh, this was one of our most watched and listened to podcasts all year, actually, is Raptors fans who rush, rushed to this podcast when they drafted Scotty Barnes ahead of, of Jalen Suggs. Your son plays at Florida State. You had a special insight into this young man uh, before the draft. You thought he'd be a star. What do you think so right now about Scotty Barnes and the way he's playing for the Toronto Raptors? I mean, I'm not surprised at all. I, I you know, my insight mostly came from just watching every minute of every game they played and knowing my son thought he was an amazing person and amazing teammate uh, and unbelievable player. You know, I'm really impressed, and we're gonna talk about Mobley too. I know they're they're just very mature in the way they they're reading the game most. Most college kids play the game. Pros read the game. These are 20-year-old guys that are that are reading the game. And, and I guess the best way to put it, Chad, would be uh, when you're – well, you have children too. When you're teaching your children to drive, you really stress to them that uh, the, the speed limit might say 65. But if you're not really comfortable uh, with where your next exit is going to be exa- or, or just how traffic is going, you're allowed to slow down. I, in fact, we recommend you slowing down so you don't injure yourself or our vehicle that we own. That's exactly what NBA players should be doing when they're young, and they almost never do. Uh, we'll talk about Alperin Sengun, who is slowing down mo- mostly because he's been hesitant about things. Scotty and, and Mobley are slowing down because they just know, I need to read this a little bit better. And so rushing causes problems. And uh, I'm very impressed that they've done that in week one, not not in month one or, or month three near the end of it. It's right now, which bodes very well for their future, I think. And in Scotty's case, he's gar- he. if you've watched Chad, I'm sure you have, he's starting positions guarding the other team's best player. They'll switch. But, like, he has, he has outplayed Jason Tatum one-on-one in preseason and regular season – uh, head on, head to head, he picks them up, and then if they switch off, fine. But he's starting to guard out all these guys, which is what I thought he could be as an elite defender. And I think Chad and and we're all guilty of this. I think as a coach, I'm less guilty because it's in our blood. It's half of the game. Defense is half of the game. We have a hard time codifying it and and, and really evaluating it uh, metrically in some cases, anyway and box scores, but I promise you as a coach, it's 50% of the game. And this guy probably along with Mobley are going to be the two best defensive players in the draft, which right away gets him ahead of the pack. So the fact that he can still get so much better, Chad, and already is the best rookie in terms of how he's impacting game, except for maybe Chris Duarte, who's 24 years old. So no surprise there. 
Yeah, Scotty's on his way to being a real special talent, I think. Yeah, a lot of the, a lot of the scouting report that that you gave us just really lined up, right? Uh, the def- the ability to guard five positions on the floor. You know, sometimes we say that hyperbolically, but in this case, it was legitimate. This was True. literally Scotty Barnes can guard one through five. We've actually seen the Raptors employ him this way. His infectious personality that we talked about, how much his teammates and coaches loved him, hearing that raves coming out of Toronto um, about how he gets along with his teammates, how he how he's interacted, his feel for the game, which you talked about, uh, and his ability to see the floor um, and to read the game, uh, as you said, I think that's really been apparent. You know, it, interestingly, he had a three to one assist to turnover ratio in the preseason and and really kind of, he actually led the team in assists. He did. Uh, not Fred Van Vliet, not Gordon Dragic. That's not been the case in the regular season. And he's actually been more turnover prone than than he was at Florida State, actually, though he did have seven assists uh, on on Wednesday night, which was uh, by, by far the best assist total that yeah. he's had so far. It's it's interesting to me, though, that the, there's a couple of areas. And, and then there's one other area that was a negative, which has turned out to be true, which is his three-point shot still needs a lot of work. And and that's I, th- I think that's still the case. Yeah. Um, though I, I'm impressed that he hasn't really been hesitant to shoot it the way, let's say, someone like Ben Simmons was coming in when he knew um, that was a weakness. But I've been impressed with his aggressiveness. If I had a concern about Scotty Barnes was that sometimes I just didn't think he attacked the way that his talent suggested that he could, that he didn't take over the game, that he didn't charge to the basket and just recognize I'm bigger, more athletic and faster than everybody. Scotty Barnes, and I actually think this is a plus. Sometimes I think it's okay for rookies to have high turnovers if it means they're being aggressive. And and Scotty's being really aggressive. And I think that's the one thing that's really stood out um, for me, uh, it, both in the preseason and the regular season, he acts like he is already a star. Um, the way he plays out there, he does not play like a rookie. He doesn't defer like a rookie, uh, and and that was probably the big pleasant surprise that I saw early on is this this Scotty Barnes in attack mode. For sure, I mean, you're you everything you said is exactly right. Uh, that was if, if he let's put it this way, if he plays at Florida State the way he's playing now, they're national champions. They were a very good team. They were a four seed, I believe. Uh, but there's a process to this. There's a growing up thing. And quite frankly, in the NBA, when you are a, you know, a number four pick, uh, it, it, it adds some ego to you that I think he needed to have and kind of swallow that. Uh, his mindset has, has been the most important transition from college. Now, college is a different game. It's more physical and it's more crowded in the paint. The pro game is so much more spread out. But his mindset to dominate the paint is not something we saw in college at all. He had a monster tip dunk over Jason Tatum. He he lurks around the rim like he's seven feet tall, which he's not, although he's super long. He bullies little guards happily, like Magic used to do with his butt, kind of runs the offense with his with his rear end when he when he has that matchup advantage. Um, I mean, I see lots of things that we, if you want to talk about when we can that he's got to get better at, including, of course, three-point shooting. But that disposition to dominate did not exist consistently in college like it does now. It bodes very well for his future and the Raptors as well. But importantly, he doesn't do it at the expense of the team. Uh, when Fred Van Bleet has it going on, Scotty gets out of the way happily. Uh, his, when you talk about reading the game and feel for the game, here's a great example. He's had a number of baskets where – He's on the perimeter. He's not a good three-point shooter, and no one's guarding him in t- intelligently. And sometimes he stays out there when the read is correct. But there's been times when he recognizes his man has lost sight of him because he's not a threat. He just cuts right to the rim. Right. One time in transition, I, th- I think it was Precious was running rim to rim. The ball was being the ball was being pushed down the left side of the court. Scotty was trailing. He had gotten the rebound and got the outlet pass. So Achiwa is now pretty much in the dunker spot, having gone down the middle. And I thought Scotty watching it live, well, I didn't watch it live, I watched it on Synergy. I thought on this play, he would just kind of park himself, what we call the slot position, like above the break on the right or left side of the floor. The ball was on the left wing. And then I thought, well, maybe he'll just stop at the top of the key because there was no one there. He just kept going right to the front of the rim. Even though when she was in the dunk spot, they threw it to Scotty, just got an easy layup. He kind of sidestepped around Pritcher, a little Peyton Pritcher from Boston. He made a nice little two-foot sidestep, avoided the charge. No one's going to see that as a highlight. But as a coach, alarm bells are ringing for me. 
had the sense to know there was a second cutter available and then didn't run over a Chua. I mean, didn't run over a pitcher, didn't try to dunk it and get a potential charge. He just got the bucket. These are these are very good signs. Uh, uh, you were right to point out his assist uh, average in, I think it was 5.6 in the preseason. He's not being asked to do that as much in the NBA, nor should he be. He isn't really that player just yet. He's got to get much, much better as a ball handler, in my opinion, if he's ever going to be an MVP level player. If he doesn't do that, he's just going to be an all-star and maybe an all-league performer because he's a two-way player. If he can develop handles the way all of our elite players like Kawhi and Durant at his size can dribble the ball, well, now he's got a chance to be an MVP level player because he's going to win a ton of games. He's right now, his net rating, I wrote it down, it's plus seven. Like, that doesn't sound like a ton, but trust me, uh, Jalen Green is minus 18. And of course, he's not a different team. I get that. But it's not like the Raptors have a big winning record or anything. He yeah. impacts wins because he plays the right way now. Just wait till his skill game explodes because I think it's going to. Does does his role change in a significant way when Siakam comes back? Um, you know, this is the one one question, right? Pascal Siakam, who you know is their all star, yeah. uh, has been out with an injury, but he's he's going to be back um, probably sooner rather than later. Uh, what role? What happens to Scotty when Siakam's back? Yeah, two things. One, he'll play less, which is good because he is exhausted in the fourth quarters. I've noticed how tired he is late in games. He only averaged like 20-something minutes. Florida State plays 11 guys. So he has not played this many minutes ever. In high school, they were blowing everyone out with four or five NBA players, whatever it was on his team. He's tired, and he's playing both ways. It's not like he could take plays off against Jason Tatum, right? There's lots of guys in the league that are very good players. Uh, LaMelo Ball and Anthony Edwards don't tend to guard the opponent's best offensive players, Scotty does. So, so he's a little fatigued. Siakam will be a welcome relief for that because he'll play a few less minutes a game, but I don't think they're going to cut many minutes. And then in terms of on-court role, not really because, again, this is where I think Nick Nurse has done a great job. They, they could ask him to do everything, the way Jalen Green, for example, is doing in Houston. I don't think that's the best thing for most players it worked for Kevin Durant many years ago, even though it, it took a long time for his team to start doing better when he was on the court. I don't think it'd be working for Scotty because he's not that kind of shooter. So playing off other guys plays perfectly into what he can do best, which is dominate off the ball. That's the one thing, you know, he, if he can learn to dominate with the ball, well, then he's Magic Johnson. That, that's a big ask. I think he's got potential for that. I don't know if he'll ever get it. No one else ever has before. That's what, There's only one Magic. But to learn to dominate off the ball and, and then pick your spots. Draymond Green is a great example of that is fine for him early in his career. Uh, and so I think that Siakam will be better. The Raptors will win more. Uh, and I think Scotty will have another primary guy along with Fred because OG Ananobi really isn't that player. So now they have those guys playing off of, of Pascal and, and Fred. And I think they'll be better. And I think he'll be better because of it in terms of metrics. You know, one, one really cool thing to end on Scotty Barnes is, Raptors fan, fans freaked out. Uh, we were talking about it, you and I. Uh, I was probably the only person that had Scotty Barnes mocked to the Raptors for 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 quite a long time because we just sort of knew about Masai and what what sort of player Masai really likes. And it, it was yeah. a tough decision between him and Jalen Suggs. Suggs also brings a lot of the things that Masai likes in a player, uh, at, you know, as well. But Raptors fr- fans were despondent. And you know, one of the cool things about doing a doing a sub stack and having this sort of collection of readers over at nbabigboard.com, you have the same thing over at True, Ho- True Hoop, yeah. is, you know, these are more advanced fans. Uh, yeah. These are these are people that are really carefully watch the game. And so one of the things I love is, you know, in the comment section and, and in the emails I get, you know, you get a lot of fans that are really intelligent about the game. And, and many of them were very, very skeptical about Barnes, but so many of them have written to me and saying, you know, I want to be a skeptic, but every game I just fall more and more in love, love with this guy and people that are non-Raptors fans say, saying the same thing. He's passed the eye test uh, around the league, same with general managers, same with scouts that we talk about. I, 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 I absolutely think that um, up to this part, he's been the biggest revelation uh, in the NBA as just, it's hard to take your eyes off Scotty Barnes. And watching when you're watching him play, and 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 I couldn't be more bullish about him. I, I think he does absolutely not just have that all star ceiling, but that superstar um, yeah. ceiling in him. You're right. There's a few things he needs to do, 
So let's pivot to Evan Mobley. Yeah. Because if we were doing a rookie of the year race right now, it would be a tight race uh, because Evan Mobley has been dominant, especially on the defensive end. I mean, we talk about Scotty Barnes being able to guard five players, but actually what Evan Mobley's impact defensively, if you look at some of the advanced numbers right now, I mean, he's been one of the best defenders in the NBA uh, early on. Uh, the Cavs are shockingly winning basketball games that we, we didn't think so. He he seems like the perfect fit. Cavs are using him in the same way. He's guarding, you know, three more, not not necessarily one through five, but but three through five for sure. Evan Mobley um, is guarding and his quickness, his ability to both protect the rim, but guard on the perimeter. And then, you know, there's been some nice stuff on the offensive end as well, though. He's a, maybe a little bit further behind there. What do you think about Evan Mobley uh, early on in his career? Man, I love him so much. I, I told I told our, our partner and founder, two of our dear friend Henry Abbott, you know, well, um, we did a show I think on Friday, and where I said, like, I said, I think I think I've been written, I think I even wrote this where I'm starting to see the light at the end of this dark Cleveland Cavaliers tunnel, mm -hmm. and it worked out great. And listen, I'm wrong all the time, and I'll go into all the details of things I've been wrong about, but. Um, I didn't expect them to win at Denver in LA, but they did. Like, I didn't see the light that quickly. I, I don't right. think they're going to make the playoffs this year. Let's be clear about that. But, uh, and Markinen, I think, has kind of been a disappointment at small forward. Uh, but they did that because they're not taking Mobley out of four. And Jared Allen's a good center, solid NBA player. It's a nice combination. Mobley is, he's a terrific player. Again, if you're going to be a one-dimensional player and there aren't one-dimensional players in the league like Damian and James Harden for many years, you have to be over-the-top elite to still impact games hugely and get paid a lot of money. And they are. And that's fine. It's just, there's just not many of those guys around. So when you look like Mobley in terms of length and size and Scotty too, you should impact defense offenses the way they do with their defense. And they're doing it. Now I'm not. I'm. A, I'm surprised that Mobley's been as good defensively as he has been because he's weak. That now Scotty Barnes is not weak anymore. Uh, right. He he looks so strong. Credit to what he's been doing since he graduated, since he left college, uh, and with Toronto, Mobley's still very weak and thin, and yet his timing and his field defensively, both those guys do what we call tall up really well. They don't foul shooters. Scotty's had some fouls aggressively trying to get uh, loose balls and steals, not so much on shots. I, I love that. I have a rule, my defensive rules, number one is don't foul. Mobley and Scotty don't foul. Mobley makes it hard to score on them. It just, I mean, most guys don't make shots in the NBA even when you just tall up and put your hands up. And he does that. Uh, offensively is where his patience has surprised me. He's, he's, not, he's not doing some things as well as he will one day, of course. But his little fake pivot game has been really good. He and Scotty both take advantage of smaller guys, just overwhelm them physically. And in Evan's case, it's impressive because he's not that strong. So he can he passes it, he handles it. Uh, I, 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 he looks so much like Chris Bosh that I'm surprised when he's not left-handed sometimes. And he has a left hand around the rim, that's good. But when he shoots his threes and his pull-up jumpers with his right hand, I have to remind myself I'm not looking at Chris Bosh. Now, I don't think he's got Bosh's quickness at this age. Now, B Bosh was exceptionally quick for a man that size at 19, 20 years of age. Mobley, I don't think is quite there yet, although I think he's close. But his skill game is better than Bosh at this age in terms of dribbling and passing it. He's a little more advanced with that. Uh, all told, you know, I'm not sure I'm right. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I was right to say Mobley had a, 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 that he was a higher, a better prospect. I've kind of flipped on that. I think Scotty probably has a chance to be a little bit better if they both reach their ceiling. But because uh, I'm not sure Mobley looks like he could be an MVP of the league, but it's not far. It's not I'm not far from that. He's a franchise guy in Cleveland. It's very fortunate to have drafted him. Yeah, I, I think that's all right. And it, again, a lot of the scouting report about Evan Mobley is just panned out to be true. And you know, people would say, well, why wouldn't it be true? But it's a transition from college basketball yeah. to the NBA. And especially early on, often we see rookies struggle. I think one of the reasons that I'm so jazzed about Mobley and Barnes is it's unusual for rookies, even rookies that turn out to be all-stars and even top 10 guys in the NBA to come out of the gate like these two guys have come out of the gate. 
and impact winning, uh, impact, uh, you know, overall their team, not just an individual box scores. And, you know, Mobley, the, the ball handling, um, you know, there, there's that, uh, I think it was in the preseason when he went coast to coast and, yeah. and dribbled behind his back. Uh, yeah. You know, he does things that you just don't typically see seven footers do. There's a fluidity to his game that, oh, that's yeah. really special. Uh, he's still also working on his three-point shot. I think it's going to come along, but it's not quite quite there yet. But his ability to take the ball at the top of the key, break his guy down off the dribble is is really impressive. And, uh, and, and then the one thing I would say is, Bosch didn't defend like this. I'm not sure Bosch defended like this ever. Um, oh, he, the way he, that- did, he did late in his career. But remember, Bosch was kind of the, the first experiment to small ball five that isn't Draymond Green. Remember, Draymond right. came after. Uh, uh, they, he was a, Chris was a four. And um, he became an elite defender because of his speed. You're not wrong. The way he protects the rim, I would give Mobley the advantage. Yeah, that, that yeah. I don't know. I don't remember his wingspan, but. He's a super long guy that's just hard to score on. And he's not trying to block your shot if you see him. He's just making it tough on you. You block the shot typically with the guy that doesn't see you or is or is too casual. And it's just hard. I will look at the numbers later. It's too early to do it. Uh, but we can we can check to see how guys are finishing on you. And I bet his numbers are going to be very low, which is a good thing. Field goal percentage against him one-on-one will be very low because he's making it tough and he's not fouling. Well, these two guys are right now the the favorites. Uh, I think right now in the rookie of the year race, uh, both have been incredibly impressive. And uh, you know, look, we're only one week right. into the season right now. Typically, rookies get better uh, in this in the second half than they do in yeah. the first half of the season. And so we're we we could see something really special uh, from both of these players. When we come back, we're going to talk about a couple of other of the top lottery picks uh, who've also played well. And we'll talk about a few lottery picks that that have struggled a little bit out of the gate. Uh, But before we do so, I want to talk about our sponsor. It's McDonald's. And McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's a place where friends and family can come to reconnect, a place where classmates can meet up for a study group, knowing they'll have dependable Wi-Fi and endless supplies of French fries and McFlurries. Win or lose, it's a place where teammates, competitors, the home team, or the away team can come to recharge. It's the place where you always look forward to stopping after a long road trip to rest your legs and refuel. I'm personally a crazy McRib fan, so I was pretty stoked when I found the McDonald's on Wednesday for lunch, and the McRib is back in season. I'm typically at McDonald's two or three times a week when it's McRib time. So head over to your local McDonald's, refuel and reconnect. Did someone say NBA Big Board Watch Party? It's McDonald's. I'm loving it. All right, Coach Thorpe. We talked about Evan Mobley. We talked about Scotty Barnes. Clearly the guys that have had, you know, the biggest impact early on. Chris Duarte also putting up big numbers, almost averaging 20 points a game. Uh, From a scoring standpoint, I think he's been the best rookie so far, just offensively shooting 41% from three uh, at, at a high volume as well. He's 24 years old. And, and we always have to add this caveat. You know, Scotty Bonds and Evan Mobley are 20. This is a four-year difference. That's a big, big deal um, in, in the NBA. Uh, he is getting starter minutes right now for Indiana because they've got some injuries and they've got, uh, you know, some guys out right now. And so he's he's playing a big role there. But I think you've got to be happy if you're Kevin Pritchard because you you have this new head coach, Rick Carlisle. He essentially told him before the draft, look, I don't want a rookie project. They actually did draft a guy later, Isaiah Jackson, who is that sort of guy and actually looks like he's got some upside in the preseason. But I want a guy that can come in and play in the rotation uh, right now. They let Doug McDermott go. So, you know, kind of fitting into the, the, the role that Doug McDermott did. And, and he's lived up to that. Uh, Duarte has really not missed a beat from his senior Oregon season. He looks like the Duarte that we saw at Oregon uh, as a senior. Uh, he's defending. Uh, he can score the basketball in multiple ways. Uh, off to a really great start if you're Indiana and look at the age of 24 when you're drafting 13th, I think they're going to end up being really happy with, with uh, where they drafted him. You're, it's not like you're getting huge upside guys anyway um, at 13, the draft, look at the rest of the draft that maybe with the exception of Sin Goon um, right now, he's the only guy that sort of really stands out right now that maybe, maybe Indiana might regret have passed on. But again, Indiana didn't necessarily need that position either, uh, where they certainly need Duarte. Uh, what have been your impressions early on for Chris Duarte? Yeah, I mean, I, I like how you use the term, uh, the phrase impact winning. 
that's what the game's all about. Ultimately, it's about winning games. And so if you just look at offensive rating, which means this is how the team is doing for 100 possessions when you're on the court and then defensive rating. So subtract defense from offense. And we have a number. That's why I said Jalen Green's minus 18. Duarte, Barnes is number one in the NBA for rookies, plus seven. Duarte is plus 3.6. I've watched three three or four of the Pacers games. I actually am interested in their team. Uh, yeah, he's a, he's a good player. He's not just a shooter. He'll, he will make the right cut and finish in, in the lane. Uh, brings some aggressiveness defensively. Kind of knows who he is. I feel like Cam Johnson is just the latest example of Dra- a, a team drafts a guy, oh, he's too high. You draft him too high because he's too old. They're trying to collect talent. You, you're not going to find many all-stars anywhere in any draft. Let's be clear. It's a, it's a game of talent accumulation. And so whether you get him in the lottery or get him in the second round or, or later in the first or free agency or uh, uh, out of the G League, get talented players. Every time a team has a player in a game is not any good, and they're forced to play him because there's no one else on the team that's any good. It's bad for the team. And at rookie scale, even, even as a late lottery pick, it's a it's a bargain to get an average NBA player worth seven, eight million dollars for three, four million dollars or whatever they're paying Duarte this year. It's a bargain. It's smart, smart management. So good job by Indiana. He absolutely could be rookie of the year because I don't vote for it, but they tend to vote for pure numbers. And his numbers might end up being better than Scotty and Evan, who are kind of more do it all kind of guys and more defensive demons. But he's, I think they, I think he's a long term solution there. They may trade Miles Turner. Uh, uh, right now, they're experimenting with two, experimenting with two bigs, like Cleveland is, amazingly enough. Um, but I think he's going to be a long term fit there. Now, when they get healthy, that's going to change things. When they get T.J. Warren back and Karis Levert back. He'll he'll probably be an off the bench guy. And not playing with Sabonis, who's this great player, and, and Miles Turner is a great shot blocker. Uh, it probably affects his overall game. We'll see. But he's a good player, and he's going to be around a long time. Yeah, and, and, and I think this is exactly right. And look, I, you know, I said this before, and some Pacers fans got upset with me, but I didn't mean it disrespectfully. I don't think Chris Duarte, even though right now he's putting up maybe the best offensive numbers of any of these rookies in – in 10 years, when we're coming back and looking at this draft class, I don't think he's going to be a top five player in this draft. And that's that's what we talk about with ceilings, all uh, right? Like those those ceilings are a little bit lower for him. But he's going to be, a, I think, a top 10 player in this draft, which means if you got him at 13, you got a great deal. And you got a guy on a team like Indiana that's trying to compete right now that can help you win basketball games right away. And so, again, I think there's just different calculations that different teams have to have to take. If, if they had taken him in the top five, uh, I, I wouldn't be happy with this pick right now. And I, I probably even would, would be happy if he's averaging 18 points a game um, right now. But where the Pacers drafted him, I think he ended up being a steal and probably should have went a few spots a few spots higher. Let's talk about Franz Wagner, a guy that uh, was a very controversial lottery pick, actually started 20, the 2021 draft kind of as a bubble first rounder guy kept moving up in part because the analytics guys loved him. They, they loved especially the defensive package that he brought because, you know, whenever you get a high rate of steals and a high rate of blocks on a player and you have both of those numbers high, uh, there's something that's going to pop in the analytics models. And that's that's sort of what happened with Franz Wagner. But, you know, when you watched him play at Mich- Michigan, you know, offensively, you know, he's not going to be an alpha. Uh, you know, his three-point shot was, was somewhat questionable. And I, I think people were back and forth on, you know, how he would fit. He wasn't great in the summer league. He wasn't great in preseason. But he's been consistently really solid for Orlando uh, in in the first uh, you know five preseason games for him, and he looks like he's exactly again what the scouting report thought thought he would be a guy who can play multiple de- uh, uh, positions on defense and who can be a complementary player on offense. And the fact that he's shooting forty one percent from three right now uh, in the early going is is a very positive sign for the Magic. Yeah, I think. He was the only guy I didn't put in the lottery on your pod that ended up going lottery. I may be wrong as we go through these lists, but I, I did not like him. Uh, I didn't, I, it wasn't because he beat Florida State in the NCAA tournament. <laughs> I, it, that wasn't at all. He was great in that game. But when I started studying tape, I, I quite frankly thought he was soft. And so, so just to finish this thought, last night, 
We're taping this on Thursday, Wednesday night. Houston, I'm sorry, Miami just beat the tar out of Brooklyn. Like, Udonis uh, Haslam has a great article in, the, in GQ. I highly recommend you read it, Chad. I just read it yesterday. All about heat culture. Well, heat cult the heat cultured Brooklyn all over the court last night. Just bullied them. This is a this is a tough physical season for different reasons. We can talk about the rule changes, whatever. Where everyone knows about them. Listen to your pod. Uh, the, it's a more physical NBA, and I did not expect it necessarily to happen so quickly. But as I watch these players to to get ready for your pod and for True Hoop. Wagner just, I just thought he played soft a lot last year in Michigan. And I'm happy to report that I was wrong. I wasn't wrong about what I saw. I was wrong about pro not projecting that he could get a little more physical because he has been. There has been a couple of plays even to highlight that this season where he just bullied smaller guys and got buckets. Uh, his defense has been good. I actually talked to a, a friend of mine with the Magic organization. Very, very happy with him. This was Two weeks ago, before the season even started. Uh, I've, been, I've watched two of their games recently. I've liked what I've seen. I've loved him. His shot looks great. If he's going to be a 3 and D guy that can also bully switches at his size against smaller guards, that's a that's a really good player who's got all-star potential. Now, he won't be, he won't be starting an all-star game, but I loved Chris Middleton in year two. And, and in fact, the GM of a team told me, uh, asked me, find a guy we can go get that you think is gettable. And I recommended Chris Middleton. He was still with the Nets. I don't know why Franz Wagner can't be Chris Middleton. He may not get there, but he's a really tall man with skill and fluidity in his hips. He can move. Uh, he's not an easy guy to stay in front of as he improves his ball handling. Middleton doesn't get by you. He shoots over you. So if I, if I was training Wagner, which I'm not, I've never met him, I would challenge him to be Chris Middleton, learn how to get your shot over people, not today or tomorrow. He's a rookie. But in time, be a good defensive player. Know how to be a second or, or third leading scorer. But a guy that we can turn to, and now he's an all-star. Well, if he doesn't get that and it's just a solid player, then great job by Orlando drafting him. I thought they made a mistake on draft night. And right now, it doesn't look like they did at all. Let's talk about Josh Giddy, a guy that I was a little bit skeptical about the the Oklahoma City Thunder taking at six uh, over Jonathan Kaminga uh, at the time over, um, you know, uh, Davian Mitchell, some other guys out there. And then we don't see him in, in summer league. Uh, he's played pretty well for Oklahoma City early on. And, and my concern about Giddy, or well, I had positive one, Giddy is an, an elite passer. He sees the floor so well. He has a great feel for the game. There's some toughness to his game, some swagger to his game. He just got absolutely roasted in Australia on the defensive end. And uh, I, I think there's still some big problems with that yeah. right now in the NBA. Uh, and and he was not a really great three-point shooter. And, and that that seemed to be two major red flags on, on what he was going to do at the next level. He shot the ball pretty well at Oklahoma City, though I certainly wouldn't call him anything like a pure shooter. Um, his passing, uh, he leads all rookies in assists. He's averaging uh, you know 5.6 assists a game, had a 10-assist game. Uh, on on Wednesday night uh, as well. But that swagger, uh, the way he approaches the game, the confidence with which he approaches the game, that's that's evident. Uh, I, 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 I'm kind of now on the fence about whether maybe Oklahoma City made the right right pick here with Giddy at six. Yeah, we don't know. Um, he can't guard at all. Uh, it's when you're evaluating players, you you can't just evaluate a defensive player individually. You have to look at it schematically as well as the, what the roster looks like. He doesn't have a lot of help. So if you think of it this way, if you think of you and I are, are kayaking and we're each in our own separate river, but we're next to each other and my river is flowing much faster than yours. Even if we're equal kayakers, it's going to appear like I'm much faster than you because my river is flowing faster. Well, in that same analogy, the Oklahoma City defense has a terrible river. It's flowing backwards. There's just <laughs> a bunch terrible. of young guys. It's, they never but they won. beat the Lakers on they Wednesday beat the Lakers night, which down, is telling. <laughs> yeah, what were they down? 25. What I watched the game. Yeah, yeah 26. Uh, LA, they were down 26 in that game. 26, yeah. LeBron didn't, you know, didn't do anything, obviously, didn't play. Um, but I it's still that, Oklahoma City. You can't pull the yeah. LeBron card when you're the Lakers and have Russell yeah. Westbrook no, and sure. Anthony Davis. Yeah. No, they're up 26 and they just laid an egg. And I thought OKC okay, played hard. Um, but my point is I can't really I I can't yet know 
if Giddy can ever be a good enough defensive player to be a stalwart uh, offensive player overall, or offensive impact player, uh, because their just team is so young and so bad. But uh, his passing is great. His feel for driving, as slow as he is, you know, if anyone who appreciates Joe Ingles, which I do, I watched a lot of jazz games last year because they were the best team in the league. Joe Ingles very slowly dribbles by everybody <laughs> because he's yeah. reading all the time. And this is what pros do. Josh Giddy's got a lot of Joe Ingles in him. Uh, but he's always been a point guard, whereas Joe initially wasn't, at least in the NBA, he wasn't. Uh, but Joe can be, Joe's a good defensive player, believe it or not. Uh, now yeah. he helps that Rudy go there behind him, but even absent that, he's a good defensive player. Josh can get there. He just, we don't know yet. He's got to get there. For you, for you to have said, you know what? He, they were right to draft him at six. He's going to have to get much better defensively. It's going to take years to figure that out. And, and I'll just remind you of this, Chad. I know you know this, but let me say it. Giannis won his MVP in year six and in year seven and won a championship him in year eight. This is a slow, long mm -hmm. marathon. Uh, it's why I like Indiana drafting Duarte. They wanted to win now. And they're allowed to make that choice when they're drafting at 12. Uh, how many teams keep their lottery picks anyway? It's so rare. Uh, if they, if I don't, I don't have a problem with you drafting a guy that you know can play. If you think, don't don't be wrong, and don't pass on a potential MVP player. But if you don't think he's an MVP guy, MVP guy on the board, get the guy that you know can play. I think Giddy, we know is going to be a good offensive player throughout his career. Defensively, we don't know yet. If he can't ever figure that out, he's he's not going to be a primary player for anyone. But he's got a chance because of what you said. That swagger helps you on defense too. You have to bring some fight. You got to bring some yeah. toughness. And the Australian league, I watch it all the time, is very tough. Very, very yeah. tough. So yeah. he should be fine. It's just going to take some time. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, one of the other things is he's been rebounding the basketball uh, at, at a high rate, which is just another plus for Oklahoma City. Look, Oklahoma City is a mess. They're really – they're 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 hard to watch. Um, there's no way the Lakers should have lost to them. There's no no reason that really any team in the NBA, including the Magic, should be losing to Oklahoma City on any any given night. Uh, even though Shea Shea will always have something he's, to say about that. He's really good. He's, he's really, re really yeah. good. And then yeah, the drop off is off a cliff, uh, yeah. right? For the for the for the rest of that team. Right. Let's talk about Davian Mitchell. Yeah. Who offensively was actually pretty good in preseason, was pretty good in summer league. That's dropped off pretty significantly, but defensively, oh my goodness. Uh, and he's been guarding some of the best guards in the NBA, uh, Damian Lillard, uh, you know, Steph Curry, uh, you know, Steph Curry had high praise for him after uh, Golden State won the game. That was his big offensive game where he had yeah. 22 points uh, in that game as well. Um, he, we knew he was the best on the ball defender in, in the draft, but uh, to watch it in the NBA, there's just not very many guys that guard like Davian Mitchell guards uh, in the NBA. Uh, you know, when you just think about sort of the intensity with which he guards other players on the, uh, on the, uh, on the ball, um, what have you thought about him so far? I mean, we're getting what we thought. Uh, he's a mature player. So, so we kind of knew going in a little bit what, what it was going to look like uh, on the ball, amazing off the ball, not, not really existent yet. I don't know that their coach is a guy that is really t doing a good job defensively. Although they've had a couple of nice wins. Harrison Barnes has he's been an all-star this year, which is great to see. I'm a fan. Um, uh, Mitchell, I think, you know, it's a weird fit. I thought it was a weird fit when they drafted him with Halliburton there. And I don't think Halliburton loves it either. He's been benched a couple of times for Mitchell in yeah. game. That's kind of a weird thing to do with a lottery pick on a team that isn't, isn't all that good with Fox as being the best player on the team. Uh, well, Barnes is the best player, but Fox is the most talented guy long term. Um, I, I think he's going to be fine. Like, I, I, if you can guard the ball like he can, you have a, you always have a spot in the league, even if you never learn to play off the ball. And he's going to be a little limited off the ball because off the ball has a lot to do with length and size, you know, height. He doesn't have any of those things. His right. toughness on the ball, though, like Pat Bev, has a, has going to have a place. He's going to be a starter in the league probably for a long time because of that. He's got to bring his offense around. It's been really terrible. Um, I, I love to remind fans of uh, one of my favorite shows, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Larry David titled it that show because he felt like he sees how happy everyone is in the world, and he's always like, keep it down a notch, all right? The rest of us aren't so excited about how the world's going. That's how I feel watching preseason. It's just preseason. 
No one's preparing special for you. They barely know what they want to do, much less what you're going to do. The NBA is different when the regular season starts. They know more about Mitchell. Uh, I think you'll be fine. He might even be really good offensively. It's it's a work in progress, like for most rookies. But having that elite skill of being able to guard the world's best scoring guards is very, very valuable. And it's going to serve him well for a long time. And Sacramento. Want to talk about Alperin Sengun, who's coming off the bench for Houston. But in those bench minutes, uh, there's there's been a lot a lot to like uh, about about his game. Yeah. Yeah, his one thing, I, when I was watching my tape the last couple of days, his hesitancy to shoot the ball is surprising to me. He's a, you know, he's a poor man's Jokic a little bit. Uh, uh, as a lottery pick on a terrible team, I just thought he might just let it fly. But it shows to me he's got a conscience, which I'm glad. I'm glad that he's not, you know, it, it probably helps that he played in Europe. A lot of our American players don't have that conscience. They, Jalen Green doesn't have that conscience. I, no one on that team except for except for uh, uh, Sengun does. But uh, knows how to play, is not afraid to bang around a little bit, got great hands. Uh, you can run offenses through him as a passer. Uh, but he, I, I, if I was coaching him, I'd tell him, when you're wide open behind three and the shot clock makes sense, the score and time context makes sense, if you want a shot, they can attack, that's fine. But don't fake two or three times and not go anywhere. Like, we want you to be able to shoot the ball. You don't, you're not hurting us by shooting wide open threes. It's in your game. And you don't got to defer to to – Kevin or to uh, Jalen, just be yourself. And that's what we need you to do. And if you can't shoot it, eventually we'll say to stop. But he, his hesitancy has been concerning. I think I just think the league is new for him. He, he didn't grow up playing with these guys. And that's something people don't really think about. When I've coached international players, I've really made them study. Where, who, what's this guy's name? Where did he go to college? Watch college tape on him. They don't even know who these guys are. They watch the NBA, but they don't know a lot of these young guys. And uh, and it's so it's weirder. It's just stranger. Danny mm-hmm. Abdi has got the same thing in Washington. He's a very talented player who just isn't really get comfortable yet. Now he got hurt last year. I think Singoon's going to be. I mean, Houston loves him, and they should. Uh, it's just going to, you know, like anything else, it's going to be a while. Just another guy that, yeah, you know, the numbers. You know, he doesn't get a lot of minutes. So the numbers are all over the place, but he screams feel. When you watch him oh, play, yeah. you, you he just screams, this guy really knows how to play. He's going to figure it out. He's going to figure out how to put it together. I think it was a really, really great pick at 16 yeah. uh, for the Rockets to be able to get him. I think at the end of the day, we're going to go back and say, you know, Sengun should have been a top 10 pick in this draft. Yeah. And uh, and for the analytics folks who saw it and had him as a top four or five pick, uh, you know, they've, they've looked pretty smart. But when we come back, we're going to talk about the two Jalens, Jalen Green and Jalen Suggs, who have been off to a, more of a rocky start um, at the start of the season. But before we do so, Coach, this wouldn't be a big board podcast if we didn't talk about Built Bar. has so many delicious flavors, something for everyone. If you're a Built Bar fan, you're definitely passionate about your faves. we got coconut, we got cherry parcia, we got raspberry, mint brownie, double chocolate, salted caramel, strawberry, orange, cookies and creams, German chocolate. My favorite flavor is coconut. It tastes like a Mounds bar. It's chewy. It's rich. It's delicious, but it's actually good for you as well. There's 17 to 18 grams of protein, calories ranging from 130 to 180 calories, only four to five grams of sugar, only four to five grams of net carbs. Order today. Get your grasshopper cookie or raspberry, whatever you like. Built Bar is also the official protein bar of the U.S. track and field team. Go to BuiltBar.com. Use promo code LOCK15. And you'll get 15% off your first order. Use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at BuiltBar.com. And we also want to talk about Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning? and Wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing the only brand their warehouse happens to carry. You have computers with access to Rock Auto at home and in your pocket. Save time and money when using Rock Auto. Why choose to spend 30, 50, or even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or a car dealership? Rock Auto is a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. They have everything you need, brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, even new carpet. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck right locked on in their how-did-you-hear-about-us box so they know we sent you amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. All right, we are back with Coach David Thorpe talking 2021 rookies, first season. It's only been a week. Most of them have played four to five games. I know there can be a bit of overreaction. Uh, some guys that are struggling will get better. 
Some guys that are doing really hot right now may hit a dry spell for a while, but let's talk about two guys that at least out of the gate have been a bit disappointing. And let's start with Jalen Green, the number two pick in the draft. Had one big night, and it was a big night. 30 points, eight for 10 from three. Looked like a player in that game that could lead the league in scoring someday. Obviously, his elite athleticism has stood out, his quickness uh, with the ball. But every other night, Jalen Green has been highly inefficient um, scoring the basketball. Uh, he struggled to, to you really find the bottom of the net. Uh, he's certainly being aggressive. He's certainly getting featured on Houston as we expected. Uh, what's your takeaway early on from watching uh, Jalen Green? Is, is this about what you expected? Are you surprised at all? And uh, what are your hopes and concerns for Green going forward? Those are great questions. Um, yeah, this is what he was in the G League. It was a small period of time, 13 games, whatever. But Chad, I have a I have my own philosophy of I think it's harder to teach players skills than it is to teach them how to play. That doesn't mean either is impossible. Of course, that's not the case at all. But when I'm evaluating prospects, when you can't play, which is most young guys, uh, well, I then have to kind of gauge, well, how hard is it going to be to get him to really understand basketball is jazz? And we're all connected in some way on our team. Um, Scotty and Mobley off the charts, jazzy. Really understand how to play instinctively in a sense. Now, we teach instincts. As dads, we teach our kids, no, you don't put your hand on the fire. Initially, they want to put their hand on the fire. Instincts mm-hmm. aren't just what you're born with. You can learn instincts. We, we do it all the time as adults. Um, Jalen's got some really terrible instincts. He plays the me game, not the we game, extremely common for someone that talented. And I don't think it's so easy to teach it. It's certainly not in a week or two or a month or two. Uh, the, the Probably the best comparison would be I was very down on Zach Levine as an incoming rookie. Other than to say I thought it could be Jamal Crawford one day. I thought he could be a great off-the-bench scorer that didn't have to read the game so much. In the second unit, you're not seeing primary defenders a whole lot, or even good shot blockers as helpers, and you can kind of do your thing. Well, Zach has finally grown past that. Uh, last year, he was an amazing offensive player and solid on defense. For Team USA, I thought Zach took another level and became one of our better players, one of our key players. And to win a, a gold medal in the Olympics is no joke. No joke. Uh, that he and Devin, Devin Booker earned a starting spot on the team. Like, that's really hard to do. Uh, and so, so Zach can do it. Jalen Green can do it, but it's going to take a long time. Like it's just not happening anytime soon. And the pressure of being the guy, the high level scorer, I think weighs on him as well. I I, I love his coach. I, I hope coach Silas can convince them. Look what Scotty and Evan are doing. They're reining themselves in and impacting the team better. And, and that's, that's a way to do it. But I will tell you, Chad, Kevin Durant, not in year one and not in year two and not in year three was his team better when he was on the court than off. They were, they were net negative when he was on the court. Their team was better when he was sitting on the bench. And yet look at him. He's one of the best, probably five, six, seven players of all time, give or take. I mean, he's that kind of player. He didn't meet a shot in like as a rookie. He was chucking up everything. PJ Carlisma played him at two guard. A lot, he was yep. a shooting guard on that team for a seven footer. And I almost felt like it, it's like if you own a, if you have kids and you own a candy store, let your kids eat all the candy they want the week one. They'll never go back on your candy store again. I felt like with Durant, who is a beautiful jazz player now, Kevin Durant, even he, Steve Nash, I think yesterday admitted uh, he probably should shoot more. I love that about KD. He, he totally understands the Wii game and is the best score maybe we've ever seen on the planet including Michael Jordan, when you factor in the three ball. So maybe Jalen will learn uh, through osmosis when he just keeps missing that taking bad shots is not the recipe for winning games and getting paid more. It's just going to be a long learning curve. He's super talented, super skilled, super athletic, and has a lot of bravado, but it's going to be a long time for he learns how to play, in my opinion. Now, and I think this is a, an area where – Certainly, the, athletically, he's elite, elite, elite. Oh uh, yeah, you know, expl- explosively, he does some things that are just jaw dropping. But he, physically, he's weak, and I think yeah. that's partly affecting, especially when he's taking the ball to the basket. It's yeah. affecting him in, in a big way. And you know, you talk about the me culture, and you know, Kevin Porter Jr.'s there in your backcourt. Christian yeah. Wood uh, is, is a very high usage player as well. 
it, it's it's one of these situations that I don't actually think is ideal for Jalen Green because it's a little bit like the Hunger Games out there, right? Like yeah. everybody's <laughs> kind of fighting to get their to get their shot uh, right yeah. now. And I was intrigued with Kevin Porter Jr. towards the end of last season, and you know how he would play on the ball and 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 with Jalen Green. I'm sort of off that experiment, uh, you know, a few games into the season and, and wonder, you know, how Jalen Green would fare with more traditional point guard um, that was looking to get, get everybody involved and, and less looking, I think, like Kevin Porter Jr. is to get himself involved as well. Um, and so it's sort of an interesting cultural fit and, and maybe something the Rockets are going to have to adjust um, as well if they're really going to continue to grow and build um, Jalen Green. I'm not down on him because I think his work ethic is, is hard. I think he cares Um, I think he's a competitive player. I think he will figure it out. And like you said, sometimes figuring it out is eating all the candy until it makes you barf and deciding maybe that's not uh, what you (laughs) want to do anymore. And so uh, I'm certainly not down on him. If if you're a Rockets fan, it it probably is a little tough to watch what what Evan Mobley and 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 Scotty Barnes are doing right now and 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 think, you know, my guy is going to be a little bit further away from that. But could he still end up leading the league and scoring someday? Absolutely. Sure. I think I think Jalen Green has that that potential. Let's talk about Jalen Suggs, who, in fairness, defensively has been good, and and we knew that coming in. You know, toughness defensively. Jalen Green, uh, Jalen Suggs was going to be a guy um, who was going to get after it defensively in the half court offense. It's been it's been ugly, uh, and you know, in Gonz- Gonzaga. With so much talent around him, he really never forced the issue. Um, he really played within a system at Gonzaga, and I think it was one of the things I really liked about uh, a Jalen Suggs, you know, coming into this draft. He didn't need to take over games or be the guy when he was surrounded with as much talent um, as he was surrounded with. But man, he seems to be forcing forcing the issue uh, in Orlando, and almost. Again, I wonder if there's a little bit of a Hunger Games situation going on with him and Cole Anthony um, a little bit as they're, you know, eventually, I don't think both of those guys are going to be starters uh, on this Magic team, you know, long term and, you know, fighting for that a little bit. Uh, What have you thought about Jalen Suggs early on? Well, first, let me qualify uh, my comments with a statement. Um, This is by far the best league in the world. Uh, I watch EuroLeague. I watch EuroCup. Uh, international games uh, in the, in the, for the national teams. Th- these are the greatest players in the world. They're not they're not the 450 best. There are some great players over there that would be very good here. But collectively, it is. And these guys are young and and have never done this before. It's a different game than college. It's it's just super hard. If they didn't have Mobley and Barnes, it'd be easier to swallow Suggs' pain a little bit. But mm-hmm. those two guys are super tall, long, special talents. Um, I don't agree necessarily that Suggs is forcing it too much. I, I've liked his patience for a guy that I know you can, Chad, you can see it. it I mean, it's 90 minutes away from me. I've watched their games. He wants to be great mm-hmm. and you can't force it. Uh, but I, I, I don't think he's been great defensively there as a team. You can't again. The river's not flowing very fast. He doesn't have a choice. His willingness to defend, I think, is legit. He wants to defend. He's got a disposition to defend. It's part of his identity, which I think is super important. I've noticed him. He overpowered. They played Miami the day, and he really overpowered Tyler Hero to score. I was really excited about that because he's a he, he's he's got some Drew Holiday in him. I don't remember who I compared him mm. to when I when I first evaluated him, but when I saw him overpower uh, Hero. And you know, because you came to visit, I had Drew Holiday in pre-draft all those years ago. Um, if it, Drew Holiday is a power forward playing point guard. I gave you that exact quote. And you probably even wrote it when, when I was training. Like, this guy's a power forward. He's built like a power forward. He was only 18. Suggs isn't quite Holiday, but he's, but he's close to it. He's a powerful man that can bully guys and doesn't really know how to do it yet because he's young. So his disposition is there. He does have to wrestle with Cole, who I think is I like I like Cole Anthony. I'm not at all convinced he isn't a starter level point guard in this league. It may not be on this team, and it'd be interesting if you had a Brett Van Vliet Kyle Lowry combination. Now you need a Kawhi Leonard and Pascal Siakam on your team to be good mm-hmm. with that backcourt. But those guys are interesting right now. Uh, Jalen's just yeah, he's just a typical rookie, and and, and Gonzaga is was so good. 
that he wasn't challenged all that much. And when he was, it's certainly in the last game, it didn't work out great. The Magic are bad. Now, they're young, but they're bad. And so you can't just will it. Not in this league. Jalen Suggs has always been able to will success. And that's great. Mm. Most guys can't. He could, but that is over now. This is the NBA, and you can't will a damn thing mm. because of who you're playing against, and especially with the guys next to you. So you just got to have to take it. Take your lumps and keep getting better. I love his disposition. I love his attitude, his competitiveness. I'm a fan, and I know the Magic are fans. I, again, I talked to someone there. They think both he and Wagner are going to be really good players, if not even great players. Uh, it's just this is not the time. There's a couple of other players we didn't talk about. Cade Cunningham, who at, at least at, at the time of this recording uh, has been out with an ankle injury. Right. Uh, it's, it sounds like that's not going to be a long-term thing for Detroit, but we haven't been able to see him play. Any concern that you have, Coach Thorpe, about a rookie that misses training camp, doesn't get to play with your team, misses preseason, misses the start of the season? How far does that put a rookie back uh, when they have to sort of come in off injury you know, even if it's a week or two into the season, but missed all of that time with your team. Does that, does that concern you at all about Cade Cunningham? Well, it, the biggest concern is only how he handles it. If he, if he feels like I have to win rookie of the year and changes the way he plays, mm -hmm. uh, I, I did not think he was a top two player in this process, in this draft. I thought it was number three. Uh, he's going to be a really good player. He, uh, they're bad. They're young and they're bad. And if they trade Jeremy Grant, which I think they should, and they'll get a decent piece for him. They'll even be worse because he's by far their best player. Uh, so, and I love Dwayne Casey, but they're going to be bad. So I don't want him to suddenly think it's the Hunger Games, as you say. Be yourself, uh, but it's going to be a it's going to be a, a tough, tough go for a while because you're so far behind for sure. And he just needs to deal with it. And they need to love him up and not feel like he's failing because he was the first pick. The injury was bad luck, and have a longer term approach, and he'll be fine. Jonathan Kaminga out with a patellar tendon strain. Based off of this Warriors team, I'm highly doubtful that even if he's fully healthy, he's seen many minutes uh, for, for for Golden State this year. And that's just, you know, partly a product of, of where he is in his development, as well as where the Warriors are right now and their priorities, which is going to be clearly on, on winning NBA championship this year. Uh, you don't expect to see a lot out of Jonathan Kaminga this year. Not in the NBA, in the G League. I, I would hope he's willing yeah. to go to the G League, learn how to play. Don't just look at raw numbers, but how is your plus-minus impact when you're on the court and off the court? How are you reading the game? Uh, and maybe bring him up sometimes and throw him in and see how he's doing, bring him back. I think NBA teams don't use the G League as well as they could and should. I'd like to see them do that with him. Zaire Williams, the 10th pick in the draft, surprisingly getting minutes on a, on yeah. a Memphis team that is clearly trying to win basketball games. Yeah. They're, they, they have no interest in, in being in the lottery. I, I'm impressed Me too. that they're finding 15, 16 minutes a night for him because he's not, he's not good. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's been pretty terrible out there. Uh, but, they're, but, but sometimes this is what you have to do if you're developing a basketball player is get them out there and let them fail. Um, let them continue to grow uh, as players. And so while there's not a lot of hopefulness right now in what you're seeing from Zaire, other than that, that he's tall and and he's athletic, uh, I do think this is the right approach. If you can, if you can stomach it from Memphis is, is get him out there 16, 17 minutes a night and, and let him swim in the deep end of the pool. I think he's got, of all the rookies I've watched, I've watched them all. He's got the prettiest shot. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. shot. And he's he's kind of he and Wagner both kind of play their roles. You'll find him typically in the left corner, sometime in the right corner, typically nowhere else really. Especially Zaire, uh, that's all you need to do with with uh, the, all the players they have. Plus John Morant, that's what he should be doing. Uh, he's got to learn how to guard on and off the ball. Uh, he's weak also physically, and these are men. You're playing with men, yeah. and and they know how to punish you. They are hammers to your nail. Uh, you will get punished as a rookie. You're going to be targeted anyway. But if you're if you're a rookie and you're kind of weak, they're going to go after you even more. And because referees are allowing more contact, it's it's even tougher for them. So, but yeah, I think I think that's the right approach. I think Memphis has really kind of turned around the last few years as a franchise. They're building something I think pretty good. Yeah, I'm 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 really bullish on on their future and and their young players and what they're doing there. James Booknight, who's really good in the preseason, isn't getting a minute. Uh, for Charlotte right now. And uh, 
you know, again, when you look at the rotation that they're playing, that's not a big surprise, but um, a sure frustrating for him. Uh, a little bit more, and Moses Moody, again, we sort of expected yeah. that with Golden State and where Golden State is. A little bit surprised that Corey Kispert, uh, a guy who was a senior, uh, Washington was the worst three-point shooting team in the league last year, um, got him for shooting. He's actually struggled. He struggled at, you know, strangely, he struggled in preseason. He struggled in summer league um, with with his shot, which is, is a big red flag because I'm not sure what Corey Kispert, you know, is really going to do for you if he's not going to sink threes. Uh, any concerns about Kispert early on? No, uh, I, I want to go back real quick here to book night. The, the Hornets already have one uh, star guard that doesn't guard anyone. They don't need two. Right. Uh, it's a great <laughs> lesson. It's a great lesson for all players, for high school to college and college to the NBA. If you can help your team on half the court uh, and then just look good on the other side of offense, uh, you can play in this league. Every NBA team has some kind of primary score. You can get off the ball. You have to be able to guard someone and you have to be able to help your teammates in guarding someone and you'll play. I promise you these, I know these coaches, they will play you if you can help them win games, which happens when you start guarding people. Uh, I talked to someone in Washington the other day uh, who, uh, who has a reason not to necessarily be a fan because it's a player. And he said, no, Kisper is going to be good. Yeah. He, he thought he's going to be a good player. And I believe him. This guy's a smart guy. Um, it's, it's, it's a hard, it's hard. It's just a tough league. And, and Washington has actually done pretty well. Uh, and they're not even healthy. They're missing their starting center from a couple of years ago in Thomas Bryant. Uh, they're, they're an interesting team because we don't know what's going to happen with Bradley Beal. I don't think, I don't think Bradley Beal is all in on the Wizards. I know he's saying all the right things, but I don't believe that. So I think there could be a real splintering there. He gets traded, and that's going to open up a lot more room for Kispert because they're not going to bring back another Bradley Beal, that's for sure. Trey Murphy uh, and Herb Jones, a second round pick. Actually, Herb Jones getting significant minutes um, right now for the, for the Pelicans. We knew he was going to be uh, one of the best defenders in this draft. It was the question about whether he could do anything on the offensive end. Uh, and, and so far that's played out. You know, he's been a plus defensively, a big minus uh, offensively. Trey Murphy, super red hot in, in summer league and preseason, cooled off a little bit, uh, which I think is to be expected when he got to actual NBA games right now. Uh, but th- so far, the Pelicans draft, where they drafted those guys, looking like, yeah. like looked like they did well. Yeah, I mean, like I said, uh, Herb Jones is the number one plus minus player in the NBA for rookies. Number one uh, overall uh, net rating, not plus minus net rating because of his defense. And that's exactly what I, I remember talking to his agents about. He's going to surprise you with his defense. And I talked to the, the people, some people in the Pelicans, and they're they're very high on him. Uh, it just, it just, I wish this is, this goes to, you know, my line of work with player development. They don't focus on defense enough. I, I want to say that I do, maybe I don't, but I definitely try to, um, it's half the game and, uh, and we need, we coaches need players to guard the ball and help, help off the ball and buy in on that. And Herb is, Herb believes in it. And, and Trey Murphy, I love, he's going to be a very good player. I have no doubt. My final plea. I, again, we, there's really no expectations after the 15th pick in the draft that these guys are going to get any minutes. Uh, I, I think that's just very normal and something that you yep. know draft prospects should think about when they enter the draft is that yep. you know James Booknight went 12th. He's not getting any minutes. Josh Primo went 11. On a, on he's going to be really good, by the way. Yeah, wow. On a not very good San Antonio team, Pop ain't playing him, uh, and you know that's that's really telling. He's also the youngest player in the league. Yeah, and, and 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 so there's there's plenty and plenty of time when we're talking about Josh Primo, and then those flashes that he's on the court, he's looked really good. But yeah. uh, right now, he, you know, he's watching the game from the bench uh, for the most part. Uh, free Bone Bones Island, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I love him, and it, to me, he could be a Jordan Clarkson type type player in the NBA. That's what he reminds me of. I'm not sure why Austin Rivers is getting the minutes that he's getting uh, right now on Denver. This is this is to me one where I think you can pull the plug on Austin Rivers, um, go through the learning pains with Bones Highland right now. Yes, maybe maybe right now Austin Rivers is better than Bones Highland because of, of his experience or whatever. But uh, you know, man, this is one guy that I I was a little bit surprised. I thought he would get into the rotation. And just watching Denver play a couple of games and watching, you know, Austin Rivers um, taking those minutes right now, I'm not sure why Bones Highland isn't getting those minutes. Yeah, um, I Denver is struggling. MP, MPJ is struggling. 
could I could see it where they do just what you say, pull the plug. Uh, I, I don't think Austin Rivers has been good for years, but he was good in some postseason games last year. And I think that's playing in Michael Malone's head a little bit. Um, again, G League starting pretty soon. They started practicing Monday. They started their practices last Monday. Uh, uh, Denver might be one of the only team. Maybe there's two teams left. They don't have a team. I think Denver still won. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they got a team now. So they put their team, their guys somewhere else. Um, these guys need to play. I'm a big believer in that. Let them go play somewhere. And uh, in the case of Denver, with Jamal Murray being out for so long, and you know he's going to be out for most of this year probably, um, they need a little spark right now. It's not Jokic is frustrated. Michael Porter Jr. is not doing great. I could see them turn to a rookie to just try to give, give some energy to the team, you know? He got in one game, and when he was out there, he did all the Bones Highland stuff that he'd been doing. You know, it, it, it popped right away, but it was in seven minutes. So, yeah. um, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Right. Last question for you, Coach Thorpe. It feels to me, and, and just talking to NBA teams and scouts and whatever, this is an extraordinary draft class. Um, this is not the huge. Um, we're talking about a number of players that are impacting the game right away, uh, a number of players that have s- superstar type ceilings um, early on. And maybe maybe the depth of the draft as we get into the 15s through 30s isn't going to pan out the way maybe, you know, frankly, the 2020 draft looks like, you know, some of the best picks like Desmond Bain were were later later in the draft. Or is he good? But at the top of this draft, this seems like it's going to be a really special draft and that that this has a chance to be one of those historic draft classes. You, you agree with that? Well, I, you know, you, you know, better than I, what would make it historic. I, I still see two real all league players with Cunningham being, you know, all-star level. I don't know. They'll ever be all league. It, it's, it's certainly possible that he is. I just not as much a fan of him as, as that and the other two, but I do allow that he can definitely be a hell of a player. Jason Tatum type. So, um, uh, if he can if get to shoot the ball and, and and do the things that Jason's done in terms of assertiveness. So I, I would call it a plus draft. I'm not ready to say it's historic in terms of depth for sure. Uh, I do think a lot of these guys can still be misses. Um, like I said, it's a marathon. It's amazing. How we, I mean, you've done this for so long, Chad. How many guys have looked so good? Michael Carter-Williams is the most obvious example, but there's many examples of guys that look the part as rookies and just don't maintain it. Mm-hmm. It's the best league in the world for a reason. These guys have to bring a huge dose of humility and hard ass work every day, watching tape, taking care of their bodies, because there's a whole bunch of good players coming in the draft next year, and it's not going to stop. And if you take your, your eye off the ball, you're going to hit right in the head. Coach Thor- Thorpe, head writer for Curb Your Enthusiasm. Uh, right there. <laughs> Earth your enthusiasm on the 2021 NBA draft. Yeah. Coach, love your work. Uh, for, for for listeners right now, you can go follow his work over at truehoop.com, uh, where he and Henry Abbott uh, just crush it every day. A very unique experience and certainly worth your subscription over at truehoop.com. You can also, Coach Thorpe read a book. He referenced it several times. Basketball is jazz. And uh, it's it's really fascinating work. Coach, I always love your insights. I love your enthusiasm. I love your positivity. I love how much you love the game and you love the players in the game. And that, that's something that's unique about you that, that I just really love. Sometimes I feel like there's too much hate on what are the greatest basketball players in the world. If you're the 430th best basketball player in the world, you are incredible. incredible. You're an incredible basketball player. Uh, and I always love that enthusiasm and the, the approach that you bring to the game. Love having you on the pod. I know our listeners love uh, listening to you as well. So thanks for taking the time to break down the 2021 rookie class with us. Thanks, Chad. Be safe, my friend. All right. You've been listening to Chad Ford's NBA Big Board on the Lockdown Podcast Network. Aloha.